The following content is provided under a Creative Commons license. Your support will help MIT OpenCourseWare continue to offer high-quality educational resources for free. To make a donation or view additional materials from hundreds of MIT courses, visit MIT OpenCourseWare at ocw.mit.edu. Okay, well, let's, yeah, let's talk about uh, then uh, Mark Jarzenbeck is a professor of architecture here and has written this really interesting book. Um, so if you have any questions uh, that so something you don't understand or like to me to clarify or elaborate, <clears throat> you know, just raise your hand and say so. I'll just sort of pick some images out. First, I'm sure you've seen, uh, you know, the Rogers Building, and uh, which doesn't exist anymore, as you know. I mean, this building still, still exists. Um, I'm not sure what happened to the store. Did they go bankrupt and fill up? Anyway, the building still exists, but this was uh, torn down. Um, <clears throat> but what I point out in my book is that, you know, if we look at this and we go, well, you know, it's uh, 1860s, <clears throat> and uh, you want to make a building for a uh, institute that you know, does sciences, uh, what do you do? I mean, what is it? What should it look like? And so we may look at this and say, well, you know, it's sort of a building like sort of any other building. But, you know, it's sort of a bit of a problem because that type of a building didn't really exist. So the architect did something, you know, which is pretty clever, but also says something about the particular world view. Um, basically, the building is sort of modeled a little bit on the Apsley House and basically is a gentleman's residence. Right. So you want to make a building, you want to make scientists and technology guys, miners walking around in their big boots, and you know you want to tell them that they're basically not just doing technology, but basically they're gentlemen. So the students that are coming in here are meant to be raised at uh, a, a level of gentlemen in the 19th century uh, sense of that. Right? They're sort of cultural holders of a type of cultural thing. They're not just you know, wandering around, shuffling around with the slide rolls in their head, thinking about uh, uh, science, right? They have a certain status in society. <clears throat> so basically, this is a gentleman's residence that is then sort of designed on the inside to be a school. So this says something about the transition of science into legitimacy and the uh, type of pre-modern notion of science, where science was still associated with sort of a gentlemanly class and gentlemanly behavior. So <clears throat> that um, is, you know, you know, MIT's sort of first sort of claim, which is sort of very expected, perhaps you think of the mid-19th century worldview. Of course, what happens is, is that <clears throat> MIT grows sort of uh, gangbusters and starts to spread out uh, in, every, uh, in every direction. So there you see the Rogers Building, um, and then there's a Walker building, which is built, which is a chemistry building, a beautiful building, one of the first buildings specifically designed for chemi chemical fumes and so forth. And then here and there and right and left and oh, you know, the, the campus expands around Copley Square um, into warehouses and into uh, sheds and other things. Uh, <clears throat> the Lowell um, Laboratory gets built here, but as you can see, it's after a while, it's, it's something like 20 buildings. And one of the big problems uh, the face was that not only is the buildings, you know, all over uh, the, around Copley Square, which is difficult if you want to go from class to class in the middle of a snowstorm, uh, but also <clears throat> science was becoming uh, changing too. So the professors were complaining they needed dust-free environments to do certain things. They needed um, laboratories that won't shake every time uh, the beer truck rumbles by, right? Yes. So if you're in the middle of a city, and 19th century cities were unbelievably stinky, fumy places filled with black soot from chimneys. Um, I mean, we, we today see these cities as, you know, clean air law has sort of done a lot to our cities. But you got to imagine in the winter, uh, the heavy, you know, odor and, and <coughs> cloud of soot making everything sort of black. And so if you're doing experiments that require special atmospheres and this and that, so the buildings, uh, the professors were complaining about being in the city. They wanted to be away from the city, away from the noise and the pollution and the sounds and all that type of stuff. So <clears throat> this was sort of one of the problems that, you know, the, the faculty sort of faced and one of the reasons that spurred along the uh, desire to sort of, uh, sort of to move. 
you know. <clears throat> so <clears throat> then the question was, well, what, you know, what do you do? Um, so, you know, you need a bigger building. So the model for this was actually in Europe, uh, mainly in Germany and in, um, and, in, um, and in Switzerland. So the ETH was created, you see, almost at the same time, uh, <clears throat> designed a little bit earlier, gigantic building, right? So here, I mean, it, I mean this makes MIT look like, uh, <laughs> I mean, literally, you know, uh, like a joke compared to what the Swiss investment in technology was, you know, at that time. Huge building, massive amount of laboratories, huge library. I mean, this was an institution of gigantic scale, right? So here we have, you know, the United States trying to, you know, create some enthusiasm for the independence of science and learning and technology as a material, um, and basically adopting, initially at least, not the German model, <clears throat> which was that this is a massive institution supported by the state government, uh, and it still is. The ETH is financed and supported by the state government. If you're a professor there, you, the prime minister has to ultimately accept your tenure proposal, not the university president. Um, whereas MIT adopted <clears throat> the sort of the English gentleman model, which is very low key, you know, uh, uh, different, different world. Ultimately, of course, this wins out. Um, but the transition is what's sort of, uh, sort of interesting about this. You know. So Robert Ware, who's founded the, um, the School of Architecture here, uh, you know, writes the first principle of architecture is truthfulness, good sense, perspicuity, considerations of method, order, form, clearness, precision, sobriety, or what make a work good working style, both in writing and in building. So in other words, he's describing you know, a building. But in reality, he's also describing what it means to be a gentleman. Right? A gentleman you know, is truthful and good and great perspicuity, uh, order, form, clearness, precision, sobriety, right? This is what you tell a young man to be, right? So the, in some sense, we can sort of read through sort of the architectural mandate, um, a type of relationship to, in fact, MIT's mandate, right? Which was what kind of men, because there's, there's all men of those types, what kind of men are we trying to shape here? <clears throat> but then, of course, the world changed. <clears throat> So in 1863, we have the four, uh, the, 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 the four you know, categories, um, of which basically fine arts and architecture um, is the only one that, that survives as such. So course four is the only one that sort of keeps going. Um, but you see in 1873, all of a sudden, um, you know, we have a different type of world. It's astonishing you know, how in basically uh, 10 years, MIT's mindset um, has, has changed. So before we had agriculture, right? A lot of farmer Joes wanting to figure out, you know, how to lay out a field, right? Well, agriculture, we know we don't do agriculture anymore, right? I mean, that's the go out in Kansas for that, right? right. Uh, the, the top of the heap is civil engineering now, right? So, you know, you can sort of see, you go from an institution that is really sort of about agriculture, geology, chemistry, you know, very sort of oddly, Primitive, I don't know, you know, it's sort of like, you know, you know, to an institution where we could sort of see uh, modernity being formed, right? <clears throat> so civil engineering, mechanical engineering, sort of geology, um, architecture stays, uh, chemistry, you know, now his, his, see here, chemistry, history, geology, and chemistry were all one department, right? We sort of, a little bit hard to imagine that, you know, natural history, uh, geology, and chemistry all being sort of one thing, right? But, you know, we sort of imagine that uh, during this time, right, there was still debate uh, about, let's say, for example, um, uh, what do you call these uh, dinosaur bones in the, in the sand? What do you call them? Fossils. Fossils. Right, right, right. No, no, okay. Right. So up until 1820, 1830, the argument was that God put the fossils there because they were the mistakes, you know, that, you know, when he made heaven and earth, he made a few mistakes. So he put, the, he put them in the ground so no one would see them. Um, and this was, you know, a current theory, right? And people thought this was sort of it, you know. So geology was sort of having to do with sort of divinity in its way, you know, because when you start digging a counter on fossil, it's like, you know, there's God's mistake, and it's like, what do you do with it? I mean, you should cover it up. You shouldn't really do it. So geology, chemistry, I mean, these, were, these, these ideas were still floating around. I mean, not so much here, but 
you know, there's, the, you can sort of see, you know, geology wasn't what this is, right? And you can see where geology is going. It goes from just, you know, looking at stones, right, to mining, right? Which is, we can sort of see by the time we get to 1900, you know, a much more sort of precise focus of how the sciences sort of operate in the real world now, right? Here, this is sort of a villa, all very abstract. Here we see the emergence of whole new, uh, new genres of reality. Um, you have a philosophy department, right? Uh, philosophy disappears, um, and then in funny way, sort of comes back in the, in, the, in the 20th century. So philosophy is still the holdover of the idea that you should know something about the world in a philosophical way. So by the 1873, we see the emergence of the professionalization uh, of the sciences, um, which means professional uh, journals, publications, um, and think all the things that you we assume completely normal today just really didn't exist actually until really into the 1880s and 1890s, um, sort of journal publications and peer-reviewed uh, peer reviewed publications and so forth like that. So then by 1900, <clears throat> we see we have now 13 departments. Right? So it's, you know, it's sort of growing exponentially, and it has continued to grow. We got no other, I don't know, 23A, B now. I mean, you know, we're, we're at least in the mid-20s. Um, and we see sort of new things, right? Where you know, MIT is, you know, America's just had the Spanish-American War. Uh, naval ships for the Defense Department are important, so we have a naval architecture thing. Uh, uh, the city is the cities in the turn of the century were really terrible, uh, complicated, messy places. Where streets were not paved, uh, sewage problems, and so forth and so on. So sanitary engineering comes sort of into play. Um, along with sort of the conventional uh, type of thing. So we have new sort of departments and new programs being sort of developed. But the point is, in some sense, what we get here is <clears throat> really the modern notion of science uh, that we just assume is completely normal. We see it literally happening, if you will, decade by decade, rapidly changing into sort of the professional world uh, that we have today. So the model of a gentleman's villa, right, it's just clearly not working. And, but, of course, the building was, remained to be functional for, for a long time. So the first attempt to, in some sense, modernize MIT's look was the Walker Building. Here's the Rogers Building next to it. And at first you go, well, it doesn't look all that much different. But it was designed with these chimneys. You see the air vent chimneys on the exterior facade so that the chemistry laboratories in, would have these vents uh, going up to vent, uh, vent the fumes. So instead of hiding the chimneys, right, the chimneys become, in, in fact, sort of part of the whole architecture. And basically, it's sort of the first real attempt to make a laboratory building at a monumental scale, right? This is in Copy Square, right across from Trinity Church. This is, you know, like one of the best real estate areas, you know, in the city, right? And to put a, a chemistry lab there, I mean, it's like, oh, you've got to be kidding me, right? So, you know, it shows the, the capacity to sort of start to think of what um, a science building is at an urban scale. <clears throat> but still, it's a relatively small building. Otherwise, um, oops, sorry about that. <clears throat> uh, they, they're living in these type of uh, warehouses. Uh, this is the architecture building and engineering building, uh, which were useful because you could muck around in there and, you know, you know nothing really, you know, there's no damage done really if you banged into something. Um, they made some of these experiments. They made the Lowell Laboratory um, down here, which at the time would have been the most advanced uh, laboratory for electrical engineering. Um, they only used it for a few years. Um, the, the building contractor is a guy called Gilbreth. Everybody's seen cheaper by the dozen. Well, anyway, he's the one who did, you know, did, built the building uh, using new techniques because you know, he was famous. You know what he was famous for? The guy? Gilbert. Well, well he, he was interested in making uh, labor less expensive. So the way you do that is you study how, let's say, you take a bricklayer, and the bricklayer's got to go get a brick, and then he's got to bring the brick down, and then he's got to put a brick in, then he's hungry, and he puts a chewing gum in his mouth, and he'll something in here, right? Well, what he figured out, that takes a lot of time, right? So you have 
uh, a, a dolly, and the dolly will bring the brick. One guy gives the brick, the other guy puts it down, the other guy slathers it. So your, your job is just to take the brick and put it down, take the brick, put it down, take the brick, put it down, take the brick. And the next guy's job is to go ka chunk, ka chunk, ka chunk, ka chunk, ka chunk, ka chunk, ka chunk. Right? And you can build buildings a lot faster if you do this sort of time saving thing. So he was a, the inventor, or you know, the tailor, or not the inventor, but one of the great champions of time saving labor. Um, Ford Motor Works would put it into mass production when the, to make a Model T Ford. So they, this was sort of advanced technology at the time, right? Um, if you will, right? Um, um, of course, has debatable effects, but anyway. So anyway, there he is, uh, <laughs> Mr. Dilberth with his uh, Cheever by the Dozen family. So, I, so they hired him. In other words, they brought in an actual uh, sort of uh, new type of engineer to experiment with a new type of building. Um, um, and so it was shows you know MIT's search for a type of um, sort of the avant-garde of the time. So then you compare, of course, that you know there's MIT's building, and this is another building from 1861, uh, the Opera by Charles Garnier in Paris. I, I don't know if you've ever seen it, but if you go to Paris, you should sort of see it. It's certainly one of the great buildings of the 19th century. I mean, vastly, hugely beautiful, uh, extravagant uh, building. So once again, in Europe, they were making these these gigantic things, right? Um, whereas at MIT in Boston, it was still, you know, small little building after a small little, um, little building. But the, this world really of, which is sort of the Beaux-Arts architecture here, is sort of a European development of how to make these buildings work within the city and so forth. It wasn't really in the United States yet. The United States building uh, styles were still English driven, still rather silly small scale, uh, still relatively sort of modest in their sort of uh, desire uh, in terms of spatial expression. So, you know, around the world, <clears throat> you know, you were having these sort of huge buildings uh, being built. <clears throat> um, and so here we are, you know, in, in, in Japan. So, you know, Boston at the time would have looked, uh, is Cairo, <laughs> I'll just show you this because, you, you know, this is the old building from the medieval period, and then they built this gigantic mosque here in, 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 in 1910, um, and the Cairo National Museum of 1900, which is you know, in the news a little bit today. So Boston in, in, you know, around 1900 would have looked like a real gritty, uh, brick, working class place. Very few prestigious buildings, very, you know, nothing really grand about the place at all. Right? You had the back bay that had been laid out, and you had some fine sort of residential quarters, <clears throat> but you really didn't have, you know, high architecture, any examples of high architecture uh, at all compared to almost everywhere else around the world. Well, in 1893, <clears throat> um, the, um, they brought in this French architect, <clears throat> a guy called Depp Pradel, uh, to teach um, the School of Architecture in the School of Architecture here. And he sort of changed everything because he brought in this much grander, much more imposing, uh, sort of uh, tradition of sort of architectural world that was in Europe um, at the time. And it was sort of a risk. <clears throat> and so they, they brought this guy, you can see, sort of a strange character. The students sort of loved him. Um, he um, was very quirky and, and much beloved uh, sort of by the students. <clears throat> he taught them how to make these absolutely drop dead gorgeous drawings, some of which are in the museum. Hopefully we can one day can um, sort of exhibit them. Uh, this drawing, which is you know gigantic, you know some 12 feet high or something, uh, <clears throat> was for a building. Of course, that was never built. I mean, it was you know impossible to build at the time. Some huge, 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 huge monuments, sort of celebrating the the Americas, called the Beacon of Progress. <clears throat> so he was very actually looked sort of like a little old-fashioned because you know it's like you know not a modern building, but it would have been a really a very early use of concrete. Um, it was actually a very interesting uh, type of edifice. And so we have to sort of see it as much more progressive than we today might, you know, uh, see things. <clears throat> um, and then he went around and bought drawings uh, for the students to learn. So this is another one of the leading architects of the time, a guy called Villa Le Duc. And uh, he and Ware uh, basically brought all these drawings from Europe uh, for the architects sort of to look at, uh, to teach them. Uh, so we have, of course, in the in the process, right, them drawing capitals and things like that uh, for presentation drawings. So all of a sudden, the principle of sort of architecture, prestige, quality buildings sort of comes into play. 
um, and these are just drawings from sort of the archives made by students uh, here uh, the turn of the century. So the point is that <clears throat> basically he changes the uh, architectural culture that's taught here from just basically uh, uh, more pragmatic architectural uh, buildings to a type of culture that is really speaks to high-end architectural production. And MIT is really the first place in the country which does that. Now, um, I mean, you and I will look at this, and this sounds all sort of old-fashioned. You know, we look at this and go, oh, this is the stuff that modernism sort of got rid of. But this would be a, um, a bit of a mistake. Um, this is a, a, a synagogue uh, that was planned, uh, largely because <clears throat> 1900 was, in that era, uh, was an interesting moment in the history. There was a Spanish-American War. And um, the two sort of, I guess, events was the, the, the crash, the market crash of 1893. 1893 was the first stock market crash in the United States, the first great one. Um, it's like we never learned, right? Uh, it was another big uh, bank financial scandal of too many people buying too much land, and then all of a sudden it went belly up. And it's like, like, duh. So anyway, um, and basically everybody was out of a job. I mean, it's, I mean, it was really, I mean, probably about 10 times worse than what we have you know, today, what we just recently experienced, and probably not quite as bad as the crash of 29, but a significant shock to the system. And after that, uh, the United States uh, warehouses were filled with stuff that no one could buy. <coughs> so what they did was they made it very cheap and they shipped it around the world. And basically, the United States, between 1890, afterwards from 1893, basically became an international supplier of, of, of things, in particular steel. So it discovered its international markets in the 1893s, after 1893. Then came the Spanish-American War, where America now was a quasi sort of colonial imperial power. So by 1900, the United States had established itself as a, uh, as a, a network, global, expanding trade world and it wanted to sort of market itself in particular ways. Well, what you could market, of course, is, is architecture. <clears throat> so MIT, you know, was by teaching its students how to make these big and huge and grand buildings, was preparing them for big time commissions around the world. And it's not just these commissions, but it was the steel that came from the, uh, the steel factories, it was the parts that came from the American parts factories. It was the labor and the contractors that came from the labor contractors. So this was all originally controlled by the French, largely, who built their buildings as export commodities. Now, MIT's Department of Architecture really was sort of at the cusp of basically producing architecture as an export commodity. So it's not just that this Beaux-Arts uh, architecture, as we call it today, is sort of frilly and, 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 and cute. It basically was the first sort of world export commodity because to make a building, you need steel, you need foundations, you need technology, you need engineers. You know, at the end, it might look sort of interesting, but it's the whole package, right? So this is why MIT developed this. And meanwhile, Harvard was looking at this, and they said, well, if MIT is gambling for the Beaux-Arts and the principle of world domination, we're, we think that this is sort of not correct, and we want architecture to be humble and you know, uh, and appropriate to sort of the human scale. And so they went into this sort of the anti-internationalist phase. They went into what's called sort of the arts and crafts. So whereas MIT went into sort of internationalism, Beaux-Arts style, uh, huge buildings, Harvard brought in faculty that made little Gothic things, right? Very beautiful, very sweet, very uh, sort of very elegant. Uh, you know, this is uh, William Brigham was one of the professors there, and these are the things you know that that, that he made, right? <laughs> All right, and um, you know, you compare that, you know, with uh, Alan Ross, who is a graduate from here, who you know went out and built huge buildings like this, mm. right? Uh, or um, uh, Hood, you know, graduate from MIT, who went off, you know, um, and did the Chicago Tribune. He did other buildings. Uh, the Rockefeller Center, designed part of the Rockefeller Center, you know, which were gigantic, you know, buildings, you know, all about, you know, the progressive spirit and so forth. So this was the, the, the two approaches that MIT and Harvard had at the time in architecture, right? Har MIT went for big scale, urban, huge, you know, projects. Harvard went for the little scale, for the domestic, for the house, and so forth. Eventually, MIT would win that argument. Uh, in the short, I mean, there's a short-term or long-term perspective on that. 
um, and Harvard would eventually bring in a French architect uh, in the first uh, decades of the 20th century. And that was sort of the end of the, the arts and crafts. And so one of the characters that sort of comes into is, of course, Bosworth, who is a product of MIT. So he, in some sense, is a student of Despardel. He knows, understands Despardel's pr principle of buildings that represent huge, you know, at the, at the big international scale, right? Not him, b buildings that are going to be sort of humble and sweet and, and gothic and nostalgic. So the, the project that he designs for MIT is at that large sort of international scale. It's meant to be, you know, big and grand. Now, <clears throat> he did, worked for uh, various people, um, but including uh, the guy, uh, a man called Fish, who was an AT&T uh, uh, CEO, uh, and where, uh, and, um, and some other people who, and, and, and Rockefellers, he was sort of like a gentleman's architect. He didn't have a big practice, he had a small practice, but basically these super rich people uh, would bring him in to design buildings. So this is one of the buildings he designed in New York. It's literally right next to the World Trade, no longer the World Trade Center, uh, the towers, uh, which you don't see anymore, which would be sort of right there. So if any of you know uh, New York, uh, the Wall Street area, uh, you would hopefully uh, know this building. Really a gorgeous building, uh, strictly neoclassical, it has a Doric on the inside, a Ionic on the outside, but it's a steel building. Basically, it's a modern steel building wrapped in this sort of uh, casing. And the casing is meant to show the stability of AT&T, the, the magnificence of it as well, right? So these buildings, uh, which we may look as sort of a little bit old fashioned, were at that time, you know, all about sort of the, the bravura of these new corporations that were emerging. So in particular, sort of AT&T, yeah. yeah, yeah. That's, that's where Bell Labs is founded in that uh, building. Bell Labs is founded yeah, in that building. Yeah, that's right. Bell Labs is founded here. Uh, <clears throat> that's right. So when MIT then was making the move, um, you know, they didn't talk to Bosworth initially. It was it came a little bit later. Um, you know, there's this huge institution. They're having these problems, and they're going, "Well, we need to find somebody." So to to to, to make design. So they hired this guy called. Uh, Childs. Uh, Childs was an expert at, in sanitation engineering. He made the sewer lines for, uh, for Brookline. Right, so, I mean, okay, he's an okay architect, but I mean, the guy makes sewer lines for crying out loud. You know. <laughs> you know. um, so he made a <laughs> project, and at first, you know, it looks okay. He's got a thing, he's got an esplanade, it's got his funny towers and so forth like that. <coughs> but, you know, it's, uh, fortunately, they realized uh, it's really bad. I mean, really, 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 really bad. Uh, so his idea was that X marks the spot. I mean, literally. And that this line, if you look at it, points to the state house because the state house is where the money comes from. Right? So you want an avenue that when I can look down, I can see the state house and say, thank you very much, state house. Even though the state house was giving them practically nothing and they were practically bankrupt. So I don't know where these lines would be pointing to, but you know, they're just off into the distance somewhere. Right? And then as you see, it's not really symmetrical. One has got longer, and then you see there's a track, and you see here one building bumps on the track. It, 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 it's really sort of weird, weird building, right? So not a good architect. And uh, obviously somebody complained about it. Well, the guy who complained about it was this man called Freeman, uh, who was a civil engineer who would later go off and design the canals for Panama Canal. So this was a really top civil engineer. And you know, compared to, if you will, some local hokey bonky you know, architect that they found you know, uh, in some sort of neighboring you know, village. So Freeman comes on the plane and said, we got to get rid of all these architects. They don't know what they're talking about. And convinces the president, McLaurin, uh, to fund him to do some research on what MIT needs to do. So he travels around the world. He goes to Mexico, goes to the United States, goes to Canada, he goes to Germany and France and Italy. And he collects his uh, portfolio of plans and photographs, and then produces this report that I published at the end in, in my book. And he falls in love with the German model of buildings like the ones that I had showed you. And he said that, you know, the Germans and the Swiss had come up already, you know, uh, 50 years earlier with this notion of a giant building, right? Not one building, you know, uh, in sort of the landscape, you know, in the gentlemanly fashion, but huge megastructures. 
um, that you know, where if you go to Berlin and you go to the Technical University in Berlin or these universities in Zurich. And so he puts the map of them uh, uh, together. And he says, this is what MIT should do. I mean, this is what we need. We need a mega structure, not just a little old building somewhere. And then to make his point, he makes a design you know, which he says, okay, this is what a bad architect would do, right? We'll have the architecture department, we have the chemistry department, we have the physics department, we've got an electrical department, we've got some labs, we'll just scatter them around, whatever, willy-nilly, right, and call that a campus, right? And so he makes this sort of fake plan, if you will, uh, to show, you know, this is how we would do it if we want to be a little bit like Harvard, and we might have a quad in there and so forth. He hated architects. He thought architects were uh, uh, pompous airheads, uh, we call some beauty makers, <clears throat> and basically the world is, uh, should be designed by civil engineers. And this was sort of an interesting moment, you know, where MIT civil engineering department is sort of asserting itself in the architectural world against the Beaux-Arts. So he doesn't like the Beaux-Arts at all. He thinks Beaux-Arts, he doesn't understand really because basically by the 1910s and so forth, right, what is being exported or is precisely dams and bridges and uh, canals and so forth, not buildings. So this is where huge investments of, of you know, exportation of MIT's world uh, position in the world has to do with civil engineering. And architecture is sort of now a little bit sort of on, uh, on a smaller scale. So his plan for MIT uh, is, looks actually quite you know, like what MIT looks like. Basically, it's a concrete building, concrete because it won't burn. And all today we go concrete, what's the hell with concrete? But you've got to remember, the Romans had concrete. And then sometime in the Middle Ages, because they didn't believe in science, they forgot how to make concrete. Um, and then no one knew what concrete was. I mean, it had completely forgotten, basically, until the 1880s. And people were going, God, we can make concrete now. So they started making concrete. And people were very uncertain about it. Um, you know, how do you, because you need to test it and stress it and, and all these times. And then in the early 19th century, the early 20th century, they finally figured out that by putting steel mesh into the concrete, you can sort of give it uh, a substance, and it can both be compressed and, in some sense, also in tension. So that made concrete into a basically usable thing. But it was still seen as sort of uh, um, low material, right? If you do a, a building, a public building, you had to be brick. Brick was seen as prestigious, stone, marble. Blah, you know, the last thing you want to do is, 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 is concrete, right? The advantage of concrete, of course, is that it's really good against fires. And you know, the building doesn't shake when you know, the trucks go rumbling by. So he designed this for this building to be in concrete, and it would have been, and in fact, when it was built, the largest concrete building in the world, um, some million square feet, sort of giant uh, structure. And that, that in itself is, in some sense, is, you know, another aspect of the MIT reaching out to a type of really being the most modern uh, thing uh, available. So this is another building that he designed. It's a shoe factory, and you can sort of see, you know, it has the same sort of principle. The concrete structure with these columns going down the middle that become the corridor, right? Um, and then you, all you have to do is make slabs and then um, uh, the circulation system, right? You know, for people to sort of go up and down, right? So basically the concrete columns, uh, circulations in the corners. Uh, here uh, is the auditorium. And then behind here was various sort of laboratories uh, for the electrical engineers and whatnot. So he did that, and MIT thought that was all pretty good, <clears throat> but they got a little nervous uh, because, you know, they still wanted the architects to come and give a blessing to the building. They, you know, had this been built, unfortunately, the skin of it would have still had some classical furnishings because, oh, he wanted the skin. The skin was going to be out of ceramic, white ceramic, uh, so that you could wash it down. You've got to remember, in the winter, all the soot makes all the buildings black. So he didn't like that, so he invented this sort of ceramic that you could just hose down and the building would be very gleaming, you know, in the, in the spring again. So all very clever, very practical, very useful, right? Um, but MIT was a little nervous. So they went to, as many institutions do, the power elite. So at some moment, um, President McLaren, uh, you know, called up uh, Rockefeller. He said, hey, Rocky, you know. Uh, we're building a building here, and you know, can you recommend something? So, Rockefeller, and this is Theodore Vail. Theodore Vail is the president of AT&T, and he sees on the telephone, right? And he's on in his little bungalow in Jekyll Jekyll uh, Jekyll Point, where Jekyll Point in North uh, in Carolinas. They had a little villa out there, 
and he's calling. This is the first transatlantic telephone call uh, from his little bungalow in this Jekyll Island, and this is where all the rich people lived, uh, to California. Right. So this is the moment where he's, he's calling this guy and talking to him in California. Right? And so he's next to his buddy, you know, another millionaire, uh, Rockef uh, Rockefeller. And who are the people behind him? Well, they're his architects. So here he is at this unbelievably amazing moment, right? And, you know, it could be, it could be his daughter, it could be his wife, it could be some engineers. But he wants to sort of mem memorialize this moment, right, by being on the, the two guys being on the telephone, right, and the architects are behind them who are going to get the commissions to build the buildings that will represent them in the world, right? So we saw the one that... Um, that Bosworth has just done. You see him beautifully attired. He's, you know, he knows how to dress in those days. He's an MIT gentleman. And so, basically, we don't know exactly all the ins and outs, but more or less, uh, McLaurin basically calls up uh, these two, both of these men, and they both say Bosworth is the man to, uh, to do. So there was no competition. There was no announcement in the paper looking for an architect. There was no you know, at first they just went down the street and found the first shingle where the guy said, I, you know, I'm an architect. Here they called up, you know, the top CEOs and said, we need a guy who can do this building, you know, that you trust because we don't need simply, simply someone who can make the building uh, in a pragmatic way. We need someone who can give us the representational capacity that architects can bring. So they pointed to Bosworth. Now Bosworth used uh, Freeman's plans basically built Freeman's building. Here it is, you can see, and had this been built, more or less like it was, and glass put in, it would have been the first and the largest and the most important modern building in the history of ever, right? So 1913, um, it was just when modernism was starting to be discussed, you know, in Europe as well, right? <clears throat> but the Europeans would eventually figure out, let's just put in glass, you know. Let's get rid of all the skin, right? Americans were a little bit more reluctant to do that, and so that's why the modernism began in, in Europe. But this is basically a modern building and would have been on the, in every history book you know, had they just sort of stopped there. Right? <clears throat> but you know, they didn't, and they put the skin on it. But you can get a sense of basically this sort of radical, modern, clean, functional aesthetic that comes from Freeman in some of the buildings and some of the rooms that are in the corner. This is an old room now. It's got a sunk ceiling. I mean, we do all this stuff to it, and you know, uh, you, you, you get a very cushy, different world today. Uh, but you get a little bit of a sense of Vail, you know, who wanted to donate his library to MIT, and he wanted, of course, Bosworth to design the dome uh, to house this sort of library. So this is the Vail Library, um, and we see it as it was supposed to it originally was. Now today, it looked like a parking garage with these stupid lamps and. And, and then, it, of course, it, you know, I mean, I just go in there and I just really want to vomit. It was really, really, really bad. And then, you know, in 1941, they painted the dome uh, so that they thought a German airplane bomber was going to come and bomb MIT. So they painted the dome so that uh, you could turn the lights off and there wouldn't be any lights, you know. Uh, of course, the bomb, German bombers never made it to MIT and no, everyone forgot to take off the paint. Right. So you go in there and it's sort of dark and you don't have the Oculus. Uh, you know, with this warmth of the light coming down, and of course these wonderful chairs and people reading there. Um, instead, you got these sort of, uh, you know, bean bags and kids sleeping and snoring right and left. <laughs> so hopefully that can be done something about that. Um, <clears throat> so Bothworth produced. He took the modern building basically and wrapped it, as you can sort of see, in a pretty in a restrained classical, not the. The, the glorious, usually excessive classicism that you might find in other places, but a relatively restrained uh, classicism. Very, you know, simple um, uh, um, uh, sandstone facade, and of course, the, the front of it. Um, of course, the whole thing was paved because this was, in some sense, the urban center of the building. Um, in the 20s and 30s, they, you know, paving is hard to do, you've got to maintain it, and if you don't maintain it, uh, things and weeds grow and then the paving does this and this and finally you just rip the whole crap out and put in a few plants, right? <clears throat> so that's what they did um, and made it into a park, right? So that you can't see the building at all. But the building was meant to be sort of really, really visible, right? This white, beautiful uh, structure visible from across the, the river, you know, a, a clearly a statement of institutionality in, in the landscape. And then it was opened in a big celebration 
where, where Vail gave all the MIT alumni in the various clubs around the, uh, around the country uh, head, headsets. I think this is in Kansas. Uh, and so they're all listening uh, to the speeches taking place during the opening ceremony, um, you know, all at the same. So it was the first sort of simulcast, I don't know, that wouldn't be the right phrase, simul transmissions, simultaneous transmission of sound um, in the history of the world. And to make sure that people understood there was a relationship between ATT um, um, and, and its donor, Vail, um, and MIT. So this is the, the front of the ATT headquarters, and here you can see the doors of them. Um, and here you see the doors of MIT, which are basically the same doors. So when you walk into the doors, you're basically walking into the doors that say, thank you, Mr. Vail, you know, for your, for your gift. I mean, it's a bad photograph, just take my word for it. It's the same doors. <laughs> uh, it, it says so even on the construction drawings, right, you know, copy the, 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 the drawings from the AT&T headquarters. So, so MIT's relationship with AT&T, with electrical engineering, with sort of this progressive corporate world is sort of cemented in the building, right? So the building, we could say, looks like classical, but in reality what it's doing is giving MIT what it really wanted, which was a type of relationship to the corporate America. Corporate America as we assume has been around you know, for 8,000 years, really hasn't. It really starts to emerge, these giant corporations, exactly at this moment. So at that level, this building does what was happening at corporate America too, right? These large, impressive institutional buildings in the landscape that are referring to the classical past as a way to sort of stabilize their idea that we're here forever, right? Even though we're only a few years old, don't worry, like the Doric columns, we'll be around for a long time, you know. Um, Good luck. So, of course, this, uh, this building refers partially uh, to the dome of the Pantheon in Rome. I hope some of you have, have, have seen that. Um, so we have the dome, and then we have these sort of uh, columns in front. There are eight columns in front of uh, the, the real Pantheon, uh, whereas there are ten columns sort of here. And of course, the dome is much, 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 much higher because the dome of, in the Pantheon is very low, and actually you don't see it at all. Right? You can sort of see it if you're way up high <laughs> and you can sort of photograph it. But from the street level, you don't see the dome uh, at all. So it's not a, an imitation, but clearly, obviously, he's saying that the, the dome of the Pantheon, the dome of the Pantheon is one of the great buildings. Clearly, the Pantheon the, uh, translated into the idea of learning and sort of the enlightenment project of the unification of the sciences. So that's sort of uh, part of it. The other part, of course, is that if you look at the uh, dome of the Pantheon, you'll notice these capitals here are what's called Corinthian, um, which is a, sort of a typical type of capital that was developed in Rome uh, that does not match up with here, which is the capitals that are called Ionic, which are actually Greek and are a lot, uh, a lot older. So he's sort of playing with these languages to sort of craft a type of uh, MIT uh, message. So the model that he's taken is a temple of Athena and Priena. Priena is a, was a Greek town in the, uh, Turkey, in Western Turkey. Um, and so he's using the, uh, the capitals, which I show here, uh, from that temple. Right? So he wants Athena to be in there because Athena is about learning. And this, for among classicists, this temple is supposed to be seen as the most perfect temple that had ever been built. Um, and if you do architectural history, you, know, you would sort of uh, know that. <clears throat> So, you know, he takes uh, the capital of Priena here and basically copies it. So when you walk in building seven up on the third floor, you see these gigantic capitals. Well, you know, why spend, you know, $2,500 and go to Turkey and, you know, you know, and look at it? Well, you can look at it right there. I mean, there's sort of the same thing. But as you can see, the bottoms are different. The bottoms are different. Now I know you're going to like, you know, oh, well, bottoms, they all have bottoms. But bottoms, you know, it's a whole story. So he's not taking, he's taking the top and not the bottom. So where do the bottoms come from? Well, the bottoms come from another temple in Athens called the Erecteion. So here you see MIT's bases um, and compared to the Erecteion, they're a pr pretty much a perfect match. The Erecteion, anybody seen that in Acropolis, Athens? The guys travel? You gotta travel. All right. <laughs> it's a bit of a ruin now. You don't really sort of get what it, it, it seems, but it's seen as uh, one of the most sophisticated of buildings 
um, that the Greeks had ever produced. Very sort of complicated building. Not a, not a classic temple with you know, a front and a side, but actually a very, very sort of complicated temple showing that the Greeks could actually produce temples with porches and fronts and backs and this and that. Um, and so it's a different you know, type of complexity. So it's a building that shows complexity, and you can sort of see these MIT bases. Right? So he takes the bases uh, from one temple right, to show uh, sort of a type of ma architectural mastery of complexity. He takes the capitals from another temple to show Athena and knowledge and sort of purity of design. He takes the Roman idea of the great vault, right, which holds knowledge and the sciences together, and basically makes that into a type of the message, the corporate message uh, of MIT uh, that gets sort of put into its, its, its front. So today, of course, <clears throat> you know, we look at buildings and we don't see them as messages. We just see them as, you know, wow, I like that or I don't like that, right? But these buildings, with their, with, this is the great advantage of what the classical world brought while it was still being used, was that you take the pieces and you can construct like arguments out of them, right? Uh, depending on how and what you're referring to. So this was, in some sense, a message. And this was why they brought in Bosworth to, in some sense, do um, uh, uh, Freeman's project, but basically give it the proper message that it needed to have. And so what you get is really the best of both worlds, I think, is this positioning of MIT in the corporate world as the corporate progressive world was understood at that time, right? In the emerging world, but also have at its, in its core of the inside this sort of fantastic sort of concrete uh, slab building, which was also progressive in its own right, but it's not celebrated in any particular way. It's just sort of there, right? Um, and of course, that interior of the building got con repeatedly sort of nibbled on and transformed and resealings and new windows and doors. Uh, so it's very hard to, 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 to see that. The best places are the staircases, <clears throat> which if you just think 1913, these sort of really amazingly clear functional concrete staircases that you know, you, you are so uh, simple, you'd hardly think that that's anything you know, to, to be proud of, right? <laughs> But, you know, if you're thinking of what could have happened, right, which would have been um, a building in, in uh, freestanding buildings in a quad, like in the Harvard model, um, you know, it would have been a very different sort of story. So that's sort of, um, I think, the, um, yeah, that's sort of the end of my little spiel here um, about the old building, um, at least up until it was sort of built, you know. So, good. Questions, thoughts? Yeah. A little off topic, but do you think, like, the reason why we call Athena Athena has anything to do with the architecture, like the computer system? Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> it could be just coincidence. Uh, it could be just coincidence. Interesting. Um, at, at one moment, uh, Boston was seen, was trying to define itself as the Athens on the Charles. So, the Ionic columns that are on our building. Um, if you go to the, the library, I mean to the um, uh, museum, the Fine Arts Museum, there's Ionic columns. Uh, almost many of the buildings designed first by MIT and then from during the 20s and 30s will have Ionic on them. Because MIT, because Boston was sort of trying to nickname itself as like, you know, the Athens of learning and, and you know, civilization, you know, uh, uh, on the drones. So that maybe maybe leaked out. Was the infinite corridor like planned to be like the bomb like hallway that like center? Absolutely. Or? That's right, yeah. It was <clears throat> the the corridor was um, the uh, corridors were complicated spaces, as we I mean they we seem them today as pretty generic. <clears throat> but in those oh. days, um, corridors were actually very special places used um, actually novel types of spaces. Part of they were re rejected because they didn't have a good ventilation. So you needed to have very, very tall, because there's no air conditioning and there's no um, heating. So they would be sort of very cold and then in summer if you put bathrooms there, the fumes would collect and they'd be sort of stinky maybe, right? So during the 19th century, you're gonna find few buildings actually designing with corridors. But they started emerging in the late 19th century in state houses, 
parliament buildings as sort of representational places. Sort of the, uh, you know, when we say someone is lobbying, right? Because the corridor was next to these lobbies in the parliament building. So the idea that you could sort of have these corridors where pe people would hang out, places where people would hang out, was seen as sort of a positive thing. But that's one of the reasons these, these spaces in, in the building panel are so huge is because the idea was the ventilation, you don't have artificial ventilation. So all, the whole building had to be circulated through these windows and through the corridors. Um, but yeah, it was designed with these corridors in mind. The, initially, the idea was that the offices would have walls out of very thin wood, and he called them curtain walls, um, which is different from the, the technical term today in architecture, but they're literally like curtains. So that if the physics professor wanted more space, he could expand or something like that. Of course, that turned out to be completely dysfunctional because you give a professor space, you know, he's, he's never going to give it up. Right? Um, I mean, now we have these space wars at MIT, and it's just you know, it's just like to death. You know, you know, you know. We've been trying to move move one wall between two offices now for ten years. You know, in the Department of Architecture, and it's just not not going to happen. Um, so, so his idea that this was like a free plan where the corridor is the spine, the stable part of it, and the walls are sort of moving and expanding and contracting as sort of disciplines, because he knew that disciplines are moving and contracting. So he wanted a building that was very flexible. That's why there are no walls, right? It's just slab and columns, right? And then the walls are all infill, you know. Um, unfortunately, the walls became permanent, as all walls do. So even, even that would have been, you know, the idea of a, a building with no walls is just unbelievably modern. I was wondering about the bees in Massachusetts on oh, yeah. the building. Why bees in Massachusetts? <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> that's because the Romans didn't have use, right? So they're copying the Roman script. And so Mafia. you didn't have, the Romans didn't have you, so everything was V. So they just have, they stuck. The only thing about the design or the rationale behind the huge tunnel system that we have between all the buildings, it seems to be like a unique feature of the campus. Yeah, to that I don't buildings. know. Maybe you guys might have a little bit more of a clue on that. Um, I think it would have came out just almost accidentally, is what I understand. But I think so, and then I think it's more recently it's been explicit that there's mm -hmm. been connections between the new buildings. But um, that's a good paper topic for someone. Yeah, yeah that, that is a good topic. topic. There, there really are that many more like basement systems rather than just the regular systems anyways I mean there's a couple extra hallways in the basement but like in general the buildings are connected above ground just as much as they are underneath well, I'm thinking of especially the connection between like building 66 and all the way up across the Kendall Square yeah. that seemed to be pretty like deliberate to want to mm. do that in any case, I heard, I heard it was like the second longest tunnel system compared to the Pentagon or something like that. That might have been <laughs> Oh, it is. But it's pretty, pretty big. Right. Yeah. Interesting. The whole building is designed on fill because, as you know from your reading, this was all swamp. Um, and fill is, you know, not a good place to design a build, building on, right? <laughs> because, you know, it basically will want to be a swamp again. So the engineering of the building, basically, you have to design a gigantic, basically, like bathtub slab. Right, and the building sort of sits in this sort of, you know, like a, like a huge footprint, right, sort of sits down and you're, and so in other words, if you just put a point in and point in, it'll start leaning and tilting, right? So you build a big platform and then you can put your building on it. Um, so this, the engineering of this actually was hugely complicated, done by a guy called Stone, um, engineering firm Stone, which was one of the largest engineering firms in the, in the world at the time. It was also a uh, graduate. Um, Freeman was so upset when they hired Bosworth to take his plan and basically botch it, uh, that he took his entire research and burnt it. And so all we have left in the archives are these b really bad uh, photographs, that some, some snapshot that someone took of some of these sheets that are left. And they, they haven't given a cent to MIT you know, ever. Right? I mean, still today, if you talk about the, to the Freeman legacy guys, they go, we're not coming. We're not coming to meet you guys. Um, because he felt that he had really sort of studied this thing exhaustively and was going to give MIT the best building that they could possibly imagine, and was upset that MIT then basically went for Bosworth. And, you know, it's a conflict, and as I write about it in my book, between two different types of modernities. 
Right? I mean, Freeman was the type of modern person where right? he wanted concrete, he wanted engineering, he wants building to, to be proud of itself as a civil engineering uh, expression. And he understood that this was the moment of history where, a, where an institution could do that. And so he's sort of right. But there was another type of modern mo movement sort of being developed, which was the modern corporation. And MIT was sort of like trying to figure out which one do we want, right? And ultimately, they sort of opted for going with the idea that the modern corporation is what a institution like this is, as opposed to a public institution, right? So, you know, it was shifting from a public institution, uh, which had to be humble and, you know, small, to a private institution, right, like it is now, right, with one pretty much fell swoop when the guy, you know, when Eastman gave you the 10 million bucks, right, boom, it's a private institution, right. So uh, private institutions also operate on very different sort of representational models, right. So, you know, being in the world, having an argument about your position in the world was sort of key to that. And for that, only architects at the time knew how to do that, right. I don't know if they still know how to do it, but <laughs> that was the point. Uh, was there a time prior to the Freeman-Bosworth divide that architects and engineers considered themselves one and the same, or mm. was, did that never exist? Yes, probably in the 1880s, I think architecture and engineering were a lot closer. Then uh, engineering professionalized itself much earlier than architecture. Engineering was already professionalized practically in the 1880s. Um, whereas architecture started to professionalize, professionalize itself around 1900, and even then many architects were going, we don't, we don't want to be professional, we're artists. So really it was only in the 1940s really that architecture as a professional practice really sort of takes root really with, with mm -hmm. the Second World War. So being a professional practice gave engineers really a powerful leg to stand on because they understood deliverables, they understood you know, how buildings operate and, you know, function in the, in the real world, whereas architects could give you the, the appearance, right, but not, not know anything about how to build it. Mm. And that split begins to emerge around sort of 1900 between architecture as a design project and engineering. Um, so, you know, whereas when civil engineering and architecture start two different fields, right, that's when they sort of, you know, have this antagonism. Mm. But because engineers were so incredibly competent, <laughs> they could build buildings, right, you know, in their sleep. Um, I mean, sort of dumb buildings, right? So they, they thought that's how you should be building. So the engineers had, you know, something to argue for themselves. They knew how to make buildings. They knew how to make them safe. They don't burn. They don't do this. So that's all you need to do, right? Um, so that antagonism basically heats up around 1900. And this is sort of an example of that, you know. Where does, where does William Ware stand in this? Was he an engineer slash architect, or was he? Yeah, he was sort of the gentleman architect tradition idea, right? So he's the one who founds the Department of Architecture, right, along the sort of gentleman model, right? And yes, uh, engineering is important, but engineering still was something that didn't really, wasn't too much of a problem, because if you make these types of buildings, you make your walls, you put in some big beams, uh, you know, it's, there's no, not a big question, right? But if you make MIT out of concrete and a million square feet, and how do you pour it? How do you, you know, on the swampy soil? This is an engineering problem. Mm. I mean, you know, of mega proportions, right? Uh, and this is not for an architect, you know. So architecture in the mid 20th century was at a scale that engineering wasn't a real problem because most of it was just pretty easy to do. But as soon as you make big buildings like this, Different you know. Story engineer has to be really from the center. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Um, isn't the divide between architecture and engineering still a big problem that I like to because you look at buildings like the Stat Center and, <laughs> <laughs> and they both have, and they're like both very artistic but have a lot of like structural problems. So isn't that still a pretty modern problem? Well, um, my, my, my uncle who's an architect lawyer, he you know, he's, he protects, he goes to law firm, I mean, he's a law firm who, architects come to him to, you know, get him out of lawsuits. Uh, so he always says, you know, there's no, there's no such thing as a building that doesn't leak, uh, rule one, and there's no such thing as a good building that doesn't have a lawsuit. And so someone's always doing something because no one knows. I mean, my windows 
in my building 10, they leak. You know, um, I mean, and they're, they're rusted shut. I mean, the upper one, I just like, you can't even move it. I mean, I'll just, you know. So that's maybe a question of maintenance rather than design. <laughs> um, but I'm a little bit more sympathetic to Gary. You know, I think some of the lawsuit anxiety is sort of misplaced a bit because mm -hmm. most buildings uh, of that scale are going to have mistakes and problems. And anyway, almost every Gary project gets sued. He gets sued, you know, he has, you know, for every building he's got a lawsuit. So when MIT hired him, they should have known that. It, it's sort of like, <laughs> I mean, they, don't they read the newspapers, you know? <laughs> so it's, it's, yes, a little bit his fault, a little bit everybody's fault. You know, the client should have known better if they're going to get a building that is designed at, a, at the cutting edge of certain type of technological revolution. There might be problems and so forth. If they wanted a, a simpler building, they shouldn't have done it with Gary. That's the point. You know. So in the Bosworth Freeman story, would you dis could you describe the main group that we ended up with as kind of a, a solution that reflects some anxiety on the Institute's part? Because they, uh, they voted for, mm -hmm. and as the corporations had some anxiety too, trying to communicate their permanence and their established nature, which clearly sort of indicates it's in question, as we read with all the mergers and all this sort of stuff, as opposed to whether Freeman or somebody else, you know, pushing forward light spaces, international style, very new, very cutting edge, but, but leaving open the question of whether it was really the establishment. Yeah, MIT was, MIT had, a, had to, the, 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 one of the points about the book is that MIT had to learn how to find its sort of, its sort of patronage voice, right? So when they first said we want a building, you know, the guy just walked down to the store somewhere to Central Square and saw someone that said architect and said, oh, could he design this for us, right? They didn't, they didn't imagine this to be anything more complicated than just sort of, you know, going out and, and, and getting a box of cereal. Um, then they had to learn that this was an historical moment. So, I mean, they really didn't see that at the beginning. They just thought this was, we just want a campus and get some buildings up. I mean, you know, hmm. and, and what Freeman forced them to do was to sort of slow down and understand the historical moment. Once they understood the historical moment, in a way, thanks to Freeman, right, they, they, they put everything aside, waited a, a, a year or two for him to make his research, they actually thought more about the historical moment than Freeman wanted them to. Because they said the moment isn't just to do a great factory style uh, uh, you know, campus. Right? The really the historical moment is our new relationship and identity as a private institution dependent on the corporate institution now. Right? And so that's the actual thing we need. Right? So, so you know, they had to learn how to find that thanks to Freeman, but actually thanks to Freeman, then they went past Freeman, <laughs> right? Um, and articulated a different project. It was a huge spectacle. I mean, it was, there was a sort of an age where vast public spectacle, this was in the early 20th century, I mean, was something happened that you could do these things. Um, so yeah, they, they, there was a searchlight on top of the Roger building, and there's a searchlight on top of MIT building, the dome. And they got these from the, uh, some Navy frigate that was out in the dock harbor. They borrowed these searchlights. And then the, the procession, every, everybody left the procession down from Roger Buildings to the dock. And then there was a special boat. And they all piled onto the boat. Um, and the boat almost sank because no one had ever bothered <laughs> to figure out you know, what 800 people weigh. <laughs> and that would have been interesting. Right? It would have been a very different story today about you know, the death of the faculty. <laughs> <laughs> the charter sinks into the Charles. <laughs> and students dying and swimming. Yeah, and that boat is actually in the Charles. Yeah, yeah. that's what I've heard, too. Yeah. They, anybody know where you walk by that boat every day? Where you see it every day? It's a huge picture of it right at the end of the Infinite Court, right here on this wall. I just yeah. walked by it this morning. And, uh, it's almost the last one, and there's this whole little uh, uh, collage about that set of events. So then they got on the boat and they, they went on to the, the dock. MIT was supposed to have a dock, which was never actually built. Um, and then they all got out. And then every student was participating in, uh, one way or other, in an opera that was custom designed uh, called, 
uh, what was the name of his, I can't remember, uh, the, 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 the Great World or something like that, which featured the history of the world with MIT at the culminating piece of that. Um, of course. And it featured this woman called Tanner, who was this great, you know, swirly, dirty, you know, not wearing many clothes thing, and uh, illuminated with uh, red and purple and orange lights down below. It was one of the great first sort of um, light show events, right? Today we take with lights going off and on, you know, we take a thing. But this was one of the first experiments in, in light, colored light shows. Um, and Tanner did her swirly dance, and then the big opera came, and the music came, and Rockefeller gave a speech, and everybody gave speeches, and da 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 da. <clears throat> and uh, Cram, who's the head of the, the, the department, was the master of ceremonies, and then he opened the door. Um, and then the the two um, oh no, I'm sorry, the, the two the two searchlights were touching like this. And then when he opened the door, the searchlights went like that, and the MIT Roger Williams searchlight was cut off and you only had MIT searchlight on. And so that was the great heroic mm. moment. I mean, you can imagine that. I mean, it's just been spectacular. But it was all at night, so there's only one photograph that someone drew in to sort of show a little bit what it was like, but we, you know, you couldn't photograph any of that stuff. The Roger building was used until <clears throat> it was only torn down in the 20s or even, even later, right? In the 30... Th the actual, uh, I mean, the main group yeah. was built in one big swoop that was that time, but then there were various of the pieces yeah, filled right. in mm -hmm. until the end of the 20s, right? It wasn't really complete around, until around 1930. That's right. When the last of all what we now know is so if you, you look at them, they look a little different, I believe. That's right, yeah. yeah. That's right. I mean, I.M. Pei, who and studied so here. Architecture stayed over. Um, yes, the architecture is over there. So I.M. Pei, who studied here, when he was here in the, in the 40s, he was in the Roger building still. Mm. Right, you're like the last last student, you know, to, to, to use that building. Yeah, it was still, they, they rented it, the, um, the various floors at that time. Um, um, then, you know, sadly it was torn down. That's interesting. And well, there's sort of a playfulness about it. Yeah, I mean, which, yeah. you know, which I think one has to lot love. I mean, MIT, yeah. you know, had this incredible, um, I mean, you read also the, the skits that were being performed. MIT had this sort of tradition of, of, of skits and theater skits. Um, and in the yearbook, you know, you see, you know, they, 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 these guys will be dressed up as God knows what, right? And they make some skit, you know, imitating some professors or doing what like that. We lost all that. I mean, some moment MIT became very serious and all that sort of playful <laughs> skits and irony just went somewhere. I don't know where. It went to the students. Yeah. Isn't that what you're saying yeah, in your I paper? Feel, I feel like it's still around. Yeah, maybe, yeah. Maybe yeah. on like, the undergraduate level. Mm -hmm. I feel like MIT is kind of a, a more unique place than the other college campus just because of some of the weird stuff we do here. Yeah. Good point. Uh, I, I, I think the point is right. The spectacle of that occasion is notable. It was a sort of moment in time when, who knows what, there was enough technology to bring a lot of people together, but people weren't yet jaded by radio and television where they wouldn't put all their effort into that thing. You know, the allegories and the, mm -hmm. all the sort of performances and it was, you know, so, something we've studied a lot with the 150th and yeah. try to figure out what parts of it are repeatable and what parts <laughs> are <goofy>. not. <laughs> So I take it that's not going to be repeated well, this spring. Well, going to dress up as Merlin. <laughs> <laughs> well, if, 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 you do, if you dare do something like that, David, I'll be Merlin. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think you dare do it. My favorite was the golden coffin that had the yeah. mighty charter in it. Oh, yeah. Across that's the cool. river in the... Almost like Raiders of the Lost Ark. Yes, sir. <laughs> <laughs> wasn't, wasn't the, it was a, like a Venetian galley, wasn't it? That yes, was built right, to yeah. carry this stuff across the river. That's right, that's right. And it was Venetian built was up in uh, Gloucester somewhere, and they had to bring it down along mm -hmm. the coast. That's right. Yeah. And I think it's in your book yeah, that you right. talk about how it got damaged on the way or something, and they were worried yeah. about it sinking. Somebody, well, I they were worried about it sinking because they, they never really thought about people in it, and then, you know, they never tested it. Oh. I mean, it's just a barge, right? You know, just pressed right. up with all that stuff on it. You know? Yeah. So, um, you know, 
When we go to the MIT Museum, Debbie Douglas has a piece of that, a piece of the plaster. So oh, we'll really? See. Yeah. Yeah. Really? Um, yeah. Oh, interesting. Yeah. And she tells me that it's still out there in the river sometime, and maybe we'll drag well. a sonar around and see if we can find it. Get that side scan sno <laughs> sonar. What? He's an expert in this stuff. <laughs> yeah, let's this go find it. <laughs> yeah, it was, it was a great moment for MIT, there's no, no doubt. Elliot was at the ceremony. <clears throat> was he really? Yeah. Oh, um, but, I mean, you could, they were just clearly, clearly probably chafing at the bit, you know, on, on this. I mean, it was, it was a huge spectrum. It was a great moment for MIT. But, you know, the, the reality was they were practically bankrupt again because, you know, they had this great building, but the building was vastly over expensive, by more expensive than, than the, you know, the 10 millions. And so Eastman kept on dealing, dishing out millions and millions and millions. And you got to remember, uh, 10 million back then, I mean, it's not 10 million, it's even a slot today, <clears throat> but yeah. you probably have to add a zero. So something like 100 million. And I mean, which is huge amount. Yeah. I mean, as a single gift, I mean, for to, to, yeah. to create a building like this, I mean, it's like unbelievable event. I mean, in the history of philanthropy, American philanthropy is just one of these great, marvelous inventions. Uh, you know, I mean, one can think about capitalism in all sorts of ways, but you know, you go around the world and capitalism does not produce philanthropy like it ever did in the American sense, right? And this is like one of the great moments, right, of, of that. Hmm. That's uh, interesting. It said that when Eastman donated his money, he was, uh, you know, sorry? Was Mr. S he was known as Mr. Smith and he didn't want to yes, come right. down. So when did he, you know, like... Tell when did he come out? Well, yeah, when did he tell you really that he was like... Uh, it, it came out, um, I think, when McLaurin died. Um, I think he... You know, leaked, leaked, leaked it out. Uh, so it came out. I mean, it, the whole thing killed McLaurin. I mean, you know, yeah. it, it was it, 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 it made him age, you know, overnight, and you know, within a few years, he was <laughs> he was dead. You know, um, I mean, it's just astonishing. You know, I mean, you know, the type of effort it takes, the human effort and human cost, you know, to yeah. have had done this. It's in the Prescott book, but not in the part it was assigned. I think where. They, they revealed the identity of Eastman with Eastman's permission. Yeah. Once the whole thing was done, at a reception mm -hmm. for the corporation at Gray House, mm -hmm. and McLaurin basically went upstairs and mm -hmm. keeled over and died. Yeah. At the reception. Boy, that's so you ever at the president's house, you know? Yeah, that, that's, that's, that's Susan, what it was. But like right, yeah. up in their apartments. Where yeah. They were, <laughs> that's where he was fired. <laughs> Interesting. Uh <-huh. laughs> Somebody had a question in their, in their reflection about why did Eastman give the money to MIT? He was mm -hmm. not an MIT graduate. Right. Who, who asked that question? Somebody did. No? Somebody? Am I thinking? Well, I'm having a bad day here. Pardon? It was why he gave it anonymously. Okay. Okay. Why? Does anyone know? I do not know. Because uh, I think in, in Prescott's book, when MIT was Boston Tech, isn't he the one that says the reason why Eastman gave the money was that it had to do with the fact that he employed a lot of MIT graduates mm, and was impressed be. by them? Yeah. Yeah. But why he remained anonymous, I have no idea. He yeah. was a strange guy, too. Yeah. Was he? He was yeah. dead by mm -hmm. suicide within a few years mm -hmm. after all this happened. Mm -hmm. Anyway. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, I've heard, and I've never seen any evidence for this. It's also interesting to look at, is that one of the sources of MIT's big impact in 20th century industry was that uh, they were so broke after they built the buildings that they basically laid off the faculty one day a week and encouraged them to make up their income by consulting. Um, mm -hmm. And it's still true today that you know, faculty are allowed to consult one day a week. And that, born as a budget cutting measure, actually ended up huh. doing a lot to diffuse MIT's technology into wow, the American cool. industry. <laughs> uh, and I, but I've only heard that as a story. I've never actually mm -hmm. seen any documents about that. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I know that in the School of Engineering, not in School of Humanities and Social Sciences, as, as recently as 1980, uh, assistant professors were required to raise, I think it was 50% of their salary through outside grants. 
and associate professors had to raise a certain percentage and even full professors, though it was a small percentage mm -hmm. at that point. Mm -hmm. And that ended uh, basically when they started to go, well, convert over to a more more endowed professorships, things like that. It was during a fundraising venture in the, what, 1990s perhaps? You know, so that's lasted. Mark, do you think MIT's relationship to its architecture has stayed the same, or how has it changed since 1960? Well, as you point out, MIT, you know, spent so much money on the main building that basically the rest of the campus, apart from the president's house, the dormitory basically part of it. Uh, just didn't really get built. Mm. So that, I mean, for better or worse, I don't know. Uh, but the dormitory section was going to be between, you know, behind Walker, that whole area. And then eventually they built the, those two dorms back there. But they're absolutely nothing like what Bosworth had really planned. He planned a whole little sort of community uh, back mm. there. <clears throat> and so that opened up sort of this sort of this territorial problem, you know, about expansion. And so the idea of, of a mega building expanding, you know, but always be one building, then also went against the modernist ethos of sort of freestanding great buildings and so forth, right? So you had the, the, the library building, which is a lovely building. That's uh, 51 or something like that. But that was supposed to be uh, the library. Then where the music hall was, a little student center. The Hayden Library, right. Oh, right. That's right. So there's a courtyard, and the courtyard belonged to the little student center. So where the music library is would be the student center. The doors would open up, and at night you could, you know, uh, have social life. Um, and then professors. So it was professors, books, and students. It was a whole little island. Hmm. Well, well, that lasted for all of, you know, five or six years. And then they wanted, the library wanted more space, and the professors wanted more space. And then the hell with the student life and so <laughs> <laughs> so they got rid of those and made the uh, so the courtyard died you know and, and now no one goes into the courtyard and it's sort of sad you know they put some statues in there you know, hmm. <laughs> but that was this experiment but it was a, exactly a anti Bosworth world right this build a building you know like a little enclave right as opposed to this sort of connected tissue hmm. um, and so that was the beginning of sort of you know, the mistakes, I think, that the campus then eventually made. You know, then they built these buildings, which sort of continue it, but don't really continue. Whereas these buildings were designed, um, obviously, in continuation of the corridor to some degree. Um, <clears throat> and I do, I do like these buildings uh, better. But, um, but basically, the, this part of the campus just got fizzled up and chewed up, you know, with discontinuous buildings. Uh, so the worst building of them all is building nine on Mass Ave, designed by Skidmore, Owens, and Merrill. So, you know, it's when you have the steps going up to your left is a sort of a modern thing. That's also, like, connected. And it's completely disconnected. No, it's, it's connected, but not on the third floor. And the fourth floor, you've got to go down some yeah. steps. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Right, because they wanted to put five floors in the space of three floors. It didn't used to be that way. It, well, it that used to be, happened with the library. It used to be connected. That's right, that's right. So the idea of these gig giant floors and ceilings, right, was a big problem for these modern buildings because by this time we had ventilation. We don't need to have, you know, 12 foot, 20 foot floors, you know. You, know, you want eight foot, nine foot, and then, you know, you're done with it, right? So you can pack much more floor space than you could in these older buildings. But it means, of course, that you're going to ruin any kind of continuity of, of, of that. Mm, um, you know, and then they refurbished these buildings. They weren't too bad. The, the, the skins of these buildings used to be uh, uh, orange and yellow, which I thought was really lovely. And then they painted it this sort of blah, MIT blob, <laughs> I don't know, white. Not white, it's sort of beige, beigey, you know. So they painted everything, sort of this, toned everything down uh, when they did the big restoration of these buildings, which I think is really sad. Um, but yeah, I mean, this is a big, it was a problem. I mean, you know, campus design, in the beginning of the 40s, through the war, after the war, into the 70s, was basically big, chunky buildings. And this went, went against, and it was great for everywhere else. It was great for other campuses, which had big spaces, and you put a big, chunky building. So we got our student center, right, which is the big, ugly, chunky, chunky building, <laughs> you know, designed by the former dean of MIT. 
Um, so that's what, how you design buildings and this idea of these sort of continual flow buildings, open-ended spaces, this wasn't going to happen. And the Gary Building tries to return a little bit to that. I mean, that's the great thing about it. It tries to actually re-envision a world where, you know, spaces are, you can go into spaces, right? Um, and there's some flexibility, um, you know, of, of ownership to some degree. The Student Center and the Dewey Library Political Science Building remind me of, I don't know if they were designed by the same person, but were they built during the Vietnam War period? Yeah, yeah, well, 68. They remind me of being, they're like frontier garrisons. They are, they are. They're like, you know, stockades <laughs> and right. yeah, yeah, yeah. walled these, off and very good. defensive looking. You can date these buildings 1968 to 72 usually. The universities basically decided students are bad. We're going to make buildings that look like fortresses. They make out of concrete that they can't ruin, destroy, beat up, or do anything with. Huh. Um, Student Center has a certain elegance to it, designed, uh, you know, and look at it at night, it's actually quite spectacular. But basically, it's a, it is a fortress. I mean, literally. I mean, oh, it's got this shooting like, arrows yeah. yeah. up there, you know, <laughs> student yeah. revolt. I mean, you know, <laughs> I mean, it's. it's yeah. Like, what kind of a message does that send? I mean, yeah. that is like, <laughs> not good. Not good. But every university in America has one. Yeah. You know, they just, this is very popular among, okay. you know, the administrators were, they want mean looking buildings. Yeah. <laughs> Why did the, the interesting buildings like Kresge, which is kind of not normal, and the chapel, and the state center, buildings like that? Yeah, so they're they're in, the, in the 50s. And after the, <clears throat> after the 50s, the M MIT had this process you might know more about it, the, the, the new the new man type thing which they were afraid that uh, MIT students were going to be too engineering oriented and they wanted uh, MIT students to have culture you know so the culture would be cultural uh, representatives so the idea of the um, the Kresge Auditorium was where symphonies could be held and people could learn something about symphonies uh, music um, and the non-denominational chapel was a place where we sort of think, you know, after the war and after the atom bomb and MIT felt a little guilty about all that stuff, right? Um, so this was where, you know, we're going to try to he heal, right? And so we need scientists who are healing agents and are sophisticated people, not just going to go out and make bombs and whatever hell, right? So this was part of that uh, thing, right? <clears throat> So yeah, so that was you know a very uh, sliver of a moment, and that's when the you know um, Haas gets formed. You know, so it's part of the emerging sort of uh, humanities uh, mm -hmm. uh, um, you know departments get created. Um. I loved what you said in your lecture about when you were describing the, the emergence of different schools, 1873, 1900, you, you said, I don't know if you purposely said it, but you said it, uh -huh. and uh, you said, here we see modernity being formed. I thought that is a very interesting yeah. comment. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah, to the, see these departments changing and shifting absolutely. is really, uh, that's a very interesting comment. Yeah. Another good student project would be to make a family tree of the MIT departments mm -hmm. over time. And people yeah. have done these trees with yeah. other kinds of knowledge systems and yeah. try to show how each department either morphed or got substituted over time coming down. Because we've talked a lot about, or a little bit about the, the word. Is that just something I found online? Oh, um, yeah? The San Diego Club of MIT? Oh, yeah. And I think they Course numbers corresponding with things in history. Huh. Mm -hmm. so well, you find it, you just Google it, or uh, I can send it to you. Yeah, great. Yeah, the point is, in other words, <clears throat> to understand that all these shifts reflect things that are happening in the outside world. <clears throat> yeah. So, in what way does this map, which what this is, right, give us the topography of the world? Right. We we don't see what's happening in the outside world, right, but. You know, I can't remember when it was, but in 1943, you know, there's a psychology department. Right? And that lasts about 10 years, and then it disappears, right? right. You sort of scratch your head, <laughs> you know, what is that about? You know? Well, a lot to do with, you know, military psychology, mm -hmm. you know, and things like that. So all of the, 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 the shifting signifiers, you know, of these apartments, right, are really sort of traces 
of energies that are taking place, right? And MIT, in, a, in an odd way, is really, you know, something will happen and, right? You can sort of see it. I mean, it doesn't take 20 years or 30 years for these departments. I mean, what's, what's beautiful about MIT is the really rapid elasticity of these departments and coming and going, right? So that's, so in the, in the 1880s, you know, when it was the great evolution, if you will, of the idea of a professional class, right? Happened very rapidly in the 1880s, right? The emergence of a professional class, politically, in so many, so many ways, right? You just sort of see that, at, you know, in the MIT departmental structure, you know, um, you know, from a gentlemanly class to professional class, and it just happens, you know, right there, you know, right? and so all of these changes are, are mapping these forces, right? And it's a great way. It would be a, certainly a, a great thesis, you know, to yeah. to use that as yeah. a indicator. It would be definitely. Oh, when did people start referring to the courses by their number here? So, like, was it confusing for a while when they were making all these changes, or did no one say, like, oh, I'm course four? Yeah. Or, you know, and use that terminology? I don't know. Good question. Know. Debbie Douglas, when she comes, we should ask her, because mm -hmm. I know she has a particular <coughs> way of thinking about that. I, there are lots of suppositions, I guess, and I don't know that anyone has the answer, but she has some pretty interesting things to say about how the numbering so system came about. about. That, is, anybody here of the Engineering Systems Division? It's a big thing on campus today, and I, I've been very involved with them, and, and 10 years ago when it was just forming, we used to have these off-campus retreats a couple times a year to talk about sort of what this department or, or division was going to be, and it was sort of a lot of hand-wringing, but there were people in the room from you know, six or eight different schools of engineering and the management school and humanities and, and all kinds of different places and they were all talking together. And at the time, MIT had a big uh, relationship with Cambridge University in the UK. We still have a little bit of that, the Cambridge MIT Institute. And there were a couple of guests there one year from Cambridge. And we spent a whole day sort of with this kind of conversation and a little bit anxious about what's it going to be? How's it going to define itself? Where are all these people? And at the end of the day, the people from Cambridge raised their hand and they said, I just have to tell you, as worried as you all are about how you're going to make this thing work, from where we come from, it looks just totally amazing. <laughs> because at Cambridge, a department gets formed, and then for 600 years, yeah. nobody talks to anybody else in any of the other departments. <laughs> yeah. And you can't even get people in the same room together to talk yeah. about this issue. And here there are people from 10 different departments talking about this. And that was just one of those moments that sort of puts into relief what's so okay. fluid about this place. Okay. Um, yeah, yeah. What? I mean, civil engineering is now subsumed, right? It, what, what happened to civil engineering? It's one, it's still one? Yeah, I think it is. Well, I was going to, uh, I wanted to say something about the, I call it boundary crossing that takes place here at MIT. It has surely it has picked up here in the last 10 years. I mean, you see it when students that major in mechanical engineering end up doing what I would identify as electrical engineering. You know, there's just lots of crossing over in research groups. And had that, had that existed since when? Were, were there more, there must have been stricter disciplinary divides between these departments. Uh, as you go back in time, but I don't know exactly when, you know, when do you identify the end of that and the beginning of more of these interdisciplinary collaborations? Is it World War II and the RAD Lab or something like that? Or? I mean, I saw like in the MIT Museum where that little place where they had like the, like the, oh, it? something about like electrical engineering and brain and cough basically, mm -hmm. or psychology. So like that was in the nineteen forties, and that was, like they said, like this is one of the first interdisciplinary okay. projects at MIT where they combined like electrical engineering and like computer, com like proto computer. Yeah, yeah. So it's World War Two ish yeah. anyway. Yeah. I think it also relates to <coughs> like you saw from Mark's chart. I mean, if you're talking about English and history and law and theology, you really do have these six hundred year traditions, but begin with in the sciences and then certainly in engineering. I mean, you know, right. there's no field of engineering that's older than 200 years. 
and most of them are less than 100 years old. So they're, you know, anytime you're in that game, and the same is true to some degree of the sciences, and things are professionalizing over the course of the boundaries are not particularly hard. I mean, electrical engineering is this funny combination of physics and, and other kinds of engineering and that comes out in the 1880s. And computer science, I mean, that's mm -hmm. also a strange hybrid of psychology and mathematics and electrical engineering. And, um, you know, so at any given point, the disciplines that we have in a technical school are only ever going to be 40 or 50 years old in a certain way. And, yeah. But uh, it seems to have really increased in the last 15 years or so, yeah. around here anyway. I just, there's a lot going well, on. Well, I think when Roz Williams comes in, she'll talk about the yeah, sort of anxieties about, are the engineering disciplines worth anything at all anymore? Yeah, right. um, I have actually think they are, but that's another conversation. Yeah, interesting. Um, well, engineering is sort of, I don't know, in the, strikes me is from the architect, it's going downhill in the United States, going uphill in Europe. I don't know why there's a, it's a big difference. But, I, but the crossover issue, I think, at MIT is, I mean, when I leave my office, I pass a colleague's office. I pass a skin lab. I don't know what the hell goes on in there. I pass them. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that's where they, someone told me they invented artificial skin. Um, and then I pass the lab. I build a room with a lot of nitrogen tanks mm -hmm. sticking out in the hall. I don't know what the hell is in there. Then I pass uh, part of a library building, part of a library. Then I pass a, st a student center. Uh, you know, I mean, if I go, f you know, from my office to the dean's office, you know, down the hall, you know, I'm walking past three or four departments who own bits and pieces of this landscape. Yeah, yeah. And it's very irritating, you know, because to us, you know, in the dean's office, because we're going, God, I mean, why are we at the walk over here? But on the other hand, it's very MIT, yeah. right? This sort of odd you know, gerrymandering of space that we have, as frustrating as it is, is actually, you know, interesting. You know, it's sort of unique, right? Uh, yeah, you know, you can go to the MIT, to Harvard, to the architecture school, and there are only f whole building filled with architects, right? Mm -hmm. you know, I'm not gonna see people making skin lab or yeah. see a big hydrogen tanks, you know, sitting out in the hallway with yeah. smoke coming out of them, you know? Um, you know, it's just, and I think that is a part of MIT culture and, uh, should be maintained. Yeah, yeah I agree. Yeah. Um, Makes it interesting. Okay. All righty, guys. Yeah. Thank you very much.